science is about to change your life. I am Stephen Hawking, and I'd like to give you a glimpse of your future. Wow! In this series, five top scientists will investigate game-changing innovations. This is pretty mind-blowing. The top waves of progress are heading your way. We'll show you how you'll be safer. Play harder. Connect faster. Live longer. See further. And get smarter. With the technology at our disposal, the possibilities are unlimited. So welcome to the science of the future. The world we live in is a dangerous place, and mankind is a fragile species. As soon as we've dealt with one emergency, another is often upon us. From crime scenes, to battlefields and operating rooms, our five scientists investigate breakthrough technologies that are transforming our responses to life-threatening situations. The helicopter, indispensable for combat missions, a workhorse for supplying the front line. But with hostile terrain, bad weather, and enemy fire, their pilots are in constant danger. Tragic accidents are all too common. Finding ways to save crew lives is a high priority. In New York State, Chris Elias Smith has access to an exceptional pioneering system that could make helicopters far less vulnerable. I'm on my way in a regular chopper to rendezvous with the revolutionary Lockheed Martin and K-Man K-Max. Even the simplest helicopter is very hard to fly. Are you watching these guys? Yeah, so I'm waiting for my engine gauge to go green, so that's the one that I'm waiting on now. Okay. Feels like a big truck. But what makes them all unique is their maneuverability. You need super fast reactions and a feather light touch to keep the aircraft stable. This is super sensitive. Don't hit the trees. You've got throttle for speed, the cyclic for pitch and roll, plus anti-torque pedals to stop spin. A helicopter pilot has to coordinate all of these controls at the same time. There's a lot going on, especially if you're low and near the ground, things are changing incredibly quickly. Human error causes most chopper accidents, making a helicopter autopilot extremely desirable. K-Max, one of the world's leading heavy lift choppers, has had a groundbreaking systems upgrade. To eliminate risk, they remove the pilot. The K-Max can fly itself. That's so cool. The technology is so radical, it's not yet approved to fly in US airspace unmanned. So on this occasion, it's flown conventionally by a pilot that was one of the first to see it operate autonomously. The computer lands better than I do. The man who has regularly put his life in the hands of a helicopter with a mind of its own is test pilot Jerry McCauley. So you're a pilot, which I presume that means you like being in control. Pretty much by definition, yeah. <laughs> so uh, when you're sitting in here, I mean, what does that feel like? Uh, the first two times are pretty scary. Um, you know, you're, you're sitting there, you're on the ground when it usually first occurs, and uh, the aircraft lifts itself up, does a little bit of a roll. Sometimes on takeoff, we see the stick kind of go to the left, and it'll go and it'll do it until it rolls out and it'll come back. So it's almost like a ghost is flying the aircraft. From the outside, an autonomous K-Max doesn't give away any of its secrets. Even on the inside, the cockpit appears standard, except for a couple of extra buttons to activate the computerized automation. The most important one being the uh, no-low switch, no local operate. That allows the aircraft to think for its own and fly on its own. When the operating system, known as Optimus Mission Management, takes over, gyros and accelerometers automatically read airspeed, altitude, pitch, 
roll, and yaw. We've also developed different ways to, to more visually uh, look out there. Lasers, radars, uh, visual systems, like uh, just, you know, essentially cameras. Right. So all the sensors we have, and then some. The central computer then sends commands to actuators that control, among other things, its counter-rotating rotors. The brains of the aircraft are kind of in uh, two parts. The actuators that move all the controls live down here on the rods that are already existing for me to fly the aircraft. And then the computers, all the, the systems are installed in the back there. So in designing these brains, I mean, what was the main thing that they did that allowed it to be successful? Being able to do things fast enough to have the aircraft react and land safely or take off safely. The latest model even has what's called a LiDAR to automatically check landing sites and detect obstacles. More than 50 hours of in-flight training are required to become a qualified chopper pilot. How long will it take a beginner like Chris to master the KMAX and program its computer to perform a series of complex maneuvers on its own? If I can crack the training, I'll be the first neuroscientist on the planet that can instruct an autonomous KMAX helicopter. Right, so uh, we're gonna build a mission plan. The test? To arrange a route for the chopper, starting six miles from base, get it to pick up a heavy load, and then deliver it with pinpoint accuracy. We just have to give it a name, a position, and an altitude. Right. A click on the map tells the system where I want it to fly. And then go ahead and hit, so I just add a waypoint. Add a waypoint, save. Upload the data, and that's all there is to it. Midpoint. To start the mission, all I need is a video game controller. So let's go ahead and do the auto takeoff. And I just hit the go button, to the takeoff button. The takeoff button. <laughs> yep, that's it. Great, can we do the real thing? Let's go do it, excellent. My induction only took 20 minutes. Now it's time to show how the system would work with a multi-million dollar K-Max. I'm driven out to a test site, six miles away from the helicopter. So here we are. There's your GCS. Exactly the same as it was in the simulation, I guess. And we've got a uh, right flight plan ready to go. So what do I do to summon the helicopter? Just, we gotta just hit the uh, depart button. Press the depart button, just like that. So in the field, a command signal is beamed to a military satellite, bounced down to the KMAX's electronic brain, and its massive turbine engines spring into life. Today, because we are in U.S. airspace, Pilot Jerry is in control for this demonstration. So the flight plan is telling us that the helicopter is going to come and pick up this load sitting right in front of us, and then circle around, come and drop it back here? Yes. That is awesome. That, there it is. Within minutes, the K-Max approaches the pickup point. Come up quick. So it's lining itself up. It's going to land, and then we're going to hook up the load to it and continue on the mission. The chopper lands right next to its cargo. All right, and uh, just like in the simulator, pull down and hit the oh, auto takeoff. The auto takeoff. Thermals and crosswinds near the ground make lifting off with a heavy load very challenging. All right, so just hit the depart button. Go ahead and hit the depart button. Okay. The final assignment, circle the airfield and deliver the load to a specific drop zone. Here, Jerry completes the mission with incredible accuracy to within feet of the target. The question is, could a fully autonomous K-Max deliver its payload with the same precision as a professional pilot? Yes, it can. Here it is, flying autonomously in Afghanistan, delivering vital supplies to troops on the ground. It has already flown more than a thousand unmanned missions and hauled more than three million pounds of cargo. 
really blows my mind that you can pick up a game controller, a game controller, push a single button, and the result, a 6,000 pound helicopter shows up, all on its own. Kevin Petrosky is the man in charge of Lockheed's K-Max development program. So tell me about the future of K-Max. It's proven itself in Afghanistan and military applications. We could also use it in uh, search and rescue applications. We could use it in disaster recovery um, applications and humanitarian aid. Not only is a K-Max keeping pilots out of danger, it can also save lives on the ground by delivering medicines to remote locations. I can also imagine helicopters with these guidance systems, gathering intelligence, monitoring the atmosphere or working like delivery vans, but ones which never get stuck in traffic. When are we going to be ready to see these massive helicopters flying over our towns and cities with no pilot inside? And in all honesty, I don't know how I feel about that. But if it's going to massively reduce the number of helicopter accidents, maybe I can get used to it. Remote technology is removing humans from many dangerous situations. And it doesn't get more dangerous than disarming improvised explosives. Expertise and extreme dexterity are required. Can we use technology to give real-time reactions and a delicate touch to a robot? It's hard to imagine a more dangerous job than a bomb disposal expert. More than 100 have been killed in action since 9-11. Using robots instead of people is one solution. Over 2,000 have been used in Afghanistan alone, but deactivating bombs is often too delicate a task for them. Could a robot ever have the same dexterity as a human? Daniel Kraft is investigating breakthrough technology that could save thousands of lives. I'm headed to the Applied Physics Laboratory outside of Baltimore, Maryland to meet a bomb disposal expert who doesn't mind getting his, or should I say her, arms blown off. I'm told she's a bimanual dexterous robotic platform, and she's keen to meet me. This is Robo Sally. Hey, Sally. Nice to meet you, too. Wow, quite the grip. Tell me a little bit about how Sally was born. Well, Sally was born back in 2007 when we're, the lab here really started to look at advanced explosive ordnance disposal robots. Six years of intensive development later, and Robo Sally's makers claim she's the most dexterous remote control bomb disposal robot ever built. We have two arms and a torso to give a human-like capability from the waist up. We have a pan tilt unit for the head, so basically a head tracker system allows the user to pan Sally's view around and see the world as Sally sees the world. For the base, we have a mobile platform. It's got four-wheel independent steering as well as general off-road capabilities. We see this as a catch-all for any situation where the human might not want to go into a dangerous situation. You can send the robot down and be as effective as a human being. Sally's operator has an unprecedented level of control through a system called one-to-one -one teleoperation. We actually have a user who is wearing joint mapping sensors all the way from his arm to his hand. And whatever he moves, the robot moves accordingly. So it's a very intuitive control system. Sensors measure every movement the operator makes. A computer encodes them and sends them wirelessly to Sally, whose robotic hands and fingers reproduce them with extreme precision. She even features haptic feedback so that the operator can feel what she touches. Sally has a ton of sensors in her hand to the point where you can detect contact, vibration, and displacement and force generated in the hand. So you might have different sensors if Sally's being a bomb disposal robot or if Sally's going out to be a medical rescue robot, right? It could detect vital signs or pull a patient to safety. Exactly. In each arm, we have 17 degrees of freedom that we can control. So coupled with three in the torso, two in the platform, and two in the head, there's a lot of control handles to control this robot. And with the vision capabilities, can like Sally get around at night and see things us normal, able folks can't? 
Sally actually does have IR cameras as well. And so if, if we were in, in some sort of low light, she could see you know, infrared signatures as well as uh, low light capabilities in these cameras. So if we were to also turn the lights off, these cameras are sensitive enough to pick up even minute amounts of light. Time to give her a test drive. Mind machine interface, here we go. So just start out by moving slowly. Oh wow. <laughs> getting a feel for it. Right, wow, this is almost trippy. <laughs> Thumbs up. All right, that's amazing. I can actually, as I move my body, it's moving together. I can be doing pretty complex movements. Using a visor connected wirelessly to Sally's stereoscopic cameras, I can see exactly what she sees. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I am like in another world, but I'm in the world. I can see my hands as they come to me. The lab is one thing, but will Sally work in the field? Only one way to find out. We're now outside on the grounds of the Applied Physics Laboratory, and Matt and his team have me on a mission. I'm gonna drive Robo Sally to try and disarm a suspicious package. This is what over 6,000 U.S. military personnel are trained to do regularly. I see the suspicious package over there. I'll keep looking at it. And uh, I can even point to it. Yeah. Okay, here we are coming up on our suspicious package. Right over there. Yep. All right, looks like someone left the trash out. So now, leaning forward, I'm gonna remove some of this trash slow and steady. 17 movable joints in each arm replicate every move I make. This is incredible. I mean, I'm not thinking hard. It feels almost, almost natural. As I lean forward, Sally moves forward. They're just foam blocks, but Sally can lift heavy loads, anything up to 100 pounds. I feel like I need to lean forward a little more to get inside the box. There we go. So I'm moving the items to see if I see anything suspicious. Uh-huh, I see something there. Something a little suspicious looking. Try my left arm. And I'm gonna see if I can come in here and pick up the suspicious element. Slow and steady. I'm gonna work on my grip. Here we go. I don't wanna drop it though. So if you have the element in hand, Let's disarm it before it goes off. All right. So go, give let's, that wire a pull. Let's give that wire a pull. I'll get a nice grasp around it. And up. Oh. Well, still got the wire. Still got the wire, but I may have dropped the bomb. Sally's not to blame. That was operator error. Mission accomplished. Bomb defused. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but with incredible dexterity that I could pick up an actual object, inspect it, and actually pull out what could have been the blasting cap. And that is much better than having to risk the life of a soldier exactly. or anybody else. The better the robots get, the less we have to send the soldiers downrange and the more the robots can do for them. Right, and there could be a version of this that helps uh, be a medic on the battlefield exactly. as well. Or Combat casualty care and, and other things, yep. Amazingly, Sally can be operated from the other side of the world. And in addition,